Hello, everybody. Lori White with the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce, back with another edition of Chamber TV. It's episode number 153. And today we are talking with Helena Bonanno, folks. And Helena is running for governor in the Democratic primary. And it's a pleasure to be able to welcome you to Chamber TV. How are you today, Helena? Thanks, Lori. I'm good. Good to see you. I wish we were together, but it's great to be with you this way. Absolutely. So um, we are doing a series of these interviews um, with all of the candidates uh, for the governor's race. And uh, later this spring, we will start doing the candidates for the second congressional district in Rhode Island as well. And what this does is it gives us a chance to get to know all of the folks that are being brave and courageous enough and mm -hmm. smart enough to come forward and uh, toss their hat in the ring and uh, vie for everyone's vote and to be part of the discussion of our political leadership going forward. So this gives us a chance to get to know everybody and to also uh, compare notes about some of the issues that the chamber feels very strongly about. So having said that, um, Helena, I just want to say uh, welcome and tell us a little bit about uh, this decision. This was a pretty big decision on your part. Of course, we have known you for a long time in your various business roles. Um, so tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lori. And thanks for all you do for Providence, the greater Providence area, for Rhode Island. And thank you, everyone. <laughs> Uh, who is on. It's it's uh, a pleasure to be with you this way. And you're right. This was a big decision for me. I spent, as you know, 25 years at CVS. I started there on the in the ground floor, really, right out of school. I uh, had my first job. I'm not, I'm not sure if you know this, Lori, but my first job at CVS, I was responsible for uh, laying out the stores and making sure things like the Chris Christmas merchandise could fit in the stores. And over 25 years, I had almost every job you could have. And I, uh, I, I, was, I moved to every job over, around, up, down. I ended up running the retail business and I had responsibility for 200,000 people and $80 billion in sales. But a, a couple things for me along the way, I was really proud to be able to lead our decision to get out of tobacco. And for me, that was a moment of realizing we can do hard things. And I think that's true in government, too. We can do really hard things if we pull the right people together. And another part of my CVS journey was I had four kids really quickly. And uh, a year after my youngest was born, I found out that I had cancer. And uh, the reason that I realized how lucky I was was I had health insurance. I had paid time off. And so... I, uh, I, want, I want to make sure that all Rhode Islanders have the opportunity to get back up when they're down. And so the reason I jumped into this race was I saw that people were really hurting in the pandemic. And uh, particularly women and people of color had really been left behind. And that worried me. And I also look at the state of state government. It is not serving the people of Rhode Island. You know, three very simple examples around that. Today, you have to wait 90 minutes on the phone to get your SNAP benefits. So while the rest of the country has rising usage of SNAP benefits, ours are down. We see that children are not getting served uh, as they're trying to access services in the state. We also know we're leaving millions of dollars on the table for people who risk being evicted from their homes. So I see every day the way that that government is not working for the people of this state. And I believe that I have the leadership skills to make state work for people. I also look at the billions of dollars that are coming in. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. We can talk more about it, Lori, but I think that with my experience set, I know how to tackle that kind of opportunity and really make sure that the money that we're getting from the federal government gets put to use in the right way, in a way we can all trust, it's transparent, and it's really going to the people of Rhode Island and setting us up for the next decade. So I'm really excited to be in the race. It was a very hard decision, but I've been super energized by all the people I'm meeting. And I really feel that I could make a huge difference because I'm the only one running who hasn't been a politician my whole life. Well, first, on behalf of the chamber, we want to say um, congratulations to you and to P. 
people like you. And we are always um, encouraging our business leaders, our members to think about running for public mm -hmm. office. And it's definitely not easy to be, you know, to throw your hat in the ring and to, you know, run the marathon and any other, you know, cliche that we could throw out there. But this is, you know, truly a serious matter because we need smart, energetic people who understand the lay of the land, who understand what it, you know, the importance of being competitive yeah. as a state um, relative to economic development and all the other important things around job creation. Um, so having that background and understanding, you know, what really um, gets the attention of decision makers who are looking to put jobs here is something really distinct that candidates who have a business background, who uh, have been active in the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce, like you have, really bring important assets to the table. So, uh, you know, we are very excited that uh, someone with your background uh, has taken the leap and is, um, you know, actually, you know, sort of a role model for many people, you know, who say, well, I can't possibly do that. You know, I've got this, I've got that, I've got kids, I've got a career. But what you're saying is that it is possible. I am. And it, look, I had a lot of people try to talk me out of doing this. Um, people I really trust. And they said things like, well, Helena, you have, you know, you've got a great life. You've got a great, great reputation. Why, why would you try to do this? Or they said things like, oh, Helena, we're so, we're so corrupt. We're never going to figure this out. And, you know, and I realized through all those conversations that my level of conviction was really high because if people like all of us, all of you who are watching, who are so committed to this state, all that you do in the business community, you're part of this organization, Lori, thanks for your leadership, because you care, and I care deeply. And we can't just sit on the sidelines and be okay with mediocrity. We deserve so much better. And that's exactly why I'm running. And it's hard, but honestly, it is great too. I'm meeting incredible people all across the state. I feel a sense of energy because I can also see up close and personal the difference I could make. And that's exactly why I'm running. I would love, it would be such an honor for me to be able to serve the people of Rhode Island and make this the great state we should be. We'll have plenty of time to delve into the issues uh, specifically around, you know, your vision for the state, ARPA dollars, uh, the state budget, lots of things. But before we go there, um, I want to continue on this theme because I think it's pretty interesting of, you know, how, you know, what, what do you think um, would be the necessary components or the right message to get other people to consider running for public office that have, you know, perhaps a business background, a professional background, um, and I'm thinking particularly of the General Assembly. Um, I know this is a little bit beyond uh, the scope of, you know, mm -hmm. what you are accustomed to talking about on the campaign trail. But um, I want to continue to pick at this thread because we do talk about it um, a lot within chamber circles and, you know, the ability to be able to have competitive races and to have really thoughtful people who understand economic development in those seats and certainly there are a lot of really terrific legislators, but um, there, there may be some districts where, um, where folks that have specifically a very strong economic development bent um, would be a great addition. So thoughts on, you know, your little decision making process and how, you know, what messages would you suggest um, to folks that might be listening who say, yeah, you know, I could, I could maybe do that on the local level. Absolutely. I, I think that we need smart people all across the state who have experience uh, running businesses, teaching, doing the doing the great hard work that everyone who's watching this do today. And and you know, I grew up in a family where service was a very big part of of, of what we talked about at the kitchen table. Um, my grandfather, Bernie Bonanno, was a teacher at classical. And he was one of the first people to run on the school committee in, in Rhode Island. And, um, and that, that was his form of service. Um, both my parents did a lot of community service. On my mom's side, uh, my grandfather was the lead prosecutor at Nuremberg. So those are, you know, that's a big lofty job. But I do think that, um, that there, what I'm realizing now in this, in this uh, experience that I'm having is that we can really bring the smart expertise that we have as business leaders, and it does translate. 
You know, that was a real question that I wondered about. And yes, I don't understand all the way of politics like other people do who've been in office for a long time, but just good common sense, right? Asking ourselves, for example, and legislators is a great example, Lori, because the General Assembly has a huge responsibility with this $1.1 billion ARPA dollars. You know, is this, is this, what, what's the experience that you bring as business leaders? How do you bring that to the General Assembly and make sure that there's a great return on that investment for Rhode Islanders? And so, you know, the story, one story that I would just end this piece by saying is that um, when I was thinking about this run and, and, and trying to make the hard, very personal decision of doing it, one of the things that really struck me was a conversation that my uncle overheard at the end of my grandfather's life. He was being interviewed by a local reporter and his, his last race he had lost, his career had ended very badly for him and he was somewhat devastated by this. And this reporter said to him, you know, if you knew then what you know now about how your career would end, would you do it all over again? And he said, absolutely, there is nothing better. There is no higher calling than being able to serve people on a local level every single day. And so, you know, we all come, I think, as business leaders with a spirit of service. I know I always did. I'm sure everyone watching, you're, you're serving your employees, you're serving your customers. You can serve the state of Rhode Island, too. I would encourage everyone to join me in this journey because we do need the best and the brightest serving us every day. And I have tremendous respect for people who are in office. I realize now more than I ever did how hard it is. It's certainly no small feat. But but getting more people involved is a great thing to encourage, Lori. So thanks for that. Yeah. So um, the filing deadline for the General Assembly is until isn't until June. So um, you know, there's still there's plenty no. of opportunity to to think that through and to be able to you know maybe y'all can walk the district together, all of the you know the very serious pro business candidates uh, that work through the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce PAC. Uh, so there's plenty of uh, plenty of good news on that front. So yeah. let's uh, segue to some of the issues, Helena. Um, you've talked about being on the campaign trail, going meeting people, mm -hmm. um, you know, understanding what um, you know residents of Rhode Island have on their minds. So, mm -hmm. Helena, tell us a lot. Um, you know, give us a day in the life of Helena. Yeah, um, sure. the, uh, running for governor. And what are you know what are people saying about our economy yeah. and our jobs? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the best part, as I said at the beginning, is getting out and meeting people. And so I've been uh, visiting many businesses across the state and talking to a lot of people. And so uh, some of the themes that I hear from people across the state, number one, people are really worried about being priced out of Rhode Island. You know, this is an amazing state we live in, but we want to make sure that everyone can afford to live here. Uh, number two, I hear a lot about the state of our education. And this is something I'm really passionate about because as everyone watching knows, we are too far behind. We have, our kids have experienced real learning loss during COVID, but we started in a weak position. And I think that this is an economic issue. This is an issue around how do we retain the businesses that are here, give them the workforce that they need and attract new businesses. So this is something that I'm very passionate about. And as I said, I think education is an economic issue. Um, the, the, the business climate is something I hear a lot about, you know, businesses have persevered through all of this and they have in many ways treated their employees as family. This is something I hear consistently about from business leaders is I took care of my people and we want to make sure that businesses can thrive because I think that's the best way to lift people into a better life, to make sure that they can have great careers. And you do that by having businesses prosper. And so I think we can get, set a much better business climate in the state. Uh, one very simple example, and I'm sure you all talk about this on the, on the chamber, Lori, is why are we only one of about a dozen states that's taxing the PPP loan? I hear this very consistently. And, and I think it's an example of business leaders feeling like we don't value what they do. Uh, we have a massive surplus. And this was money that was taken on to keep people employed. So I think there's a whole set of things we can do, whether it's the PPP loan or just making it easier 
to do business in the state. There's so many regulations that I hear about that get in people's way. And yet business people know how to pe persevere. So, so they're doing heroic things and keeping things going in the pandemic, which I think is amazing. But, you know, look, at the end of the day, I think that the governor's role is the chief executive role in this state. And I think not being a career politician gives me the advantage of really being able to listen very deeply and making sure that we're investing in our great education all the way from universal pre-K to great workforce training programs and making sure that the people of this state are prepared for really good futures, investing in our economy so we can be thriving and making sure that we've got a state where people can afford to live here. Those are the big things I hear about every day. We know in Rhode Island, uh, constitutionally, that the role of governor, the, you know, the constitutional definition, uh, not as strong as other states in terms of, you know, powers and the like, and um, a lot of power is vested in the hands of the General Assembly and the leadership there as a, you know, again, as a, as a constitutional matter. Um, I'm wondering, given that backdrop and the necessity to be able to work across the aisle and, and across, you know, lots of branches of government, um, what would be your style in working with the legislative leadership in order to um, continue to, you know, develop programs and put forth a collaborative effort on behalf of uh, Rhode Islanders? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I have uh, had people, you know, challenge whether this is, you know, something that is, uh, whether the governor can be successful. And I absolutely think we've had great governors, um, despite this structure, let me just say. And and I think it comes down to something that I learned in my whole career, which is the only way you get big things done is by bringing people together and making those decisions together. I never sat in a corner office and, and dictated and had people execute. Uh, I just worked in an organization where it was big and complex and you couldn't do things that way. And I think the best example is that is the decision that I did lead to get out of tobacco. And that was something that was a huge team effort. Obviously, the CEO, the board were, were the key there in making it happen. But as a team, we really came together. We really understood what were all the complexities. How did I listen to people and make sure that I could take advantage of the experiences, the insights that they had? And what I learned from that, too, is that there is a real sense of pride you can create when you get hard things done. And I think that that can be true for, for Rhode Island. So look, I, I think that um, I would have a very good working relationship uh, with the leaders of the legislature. I already feel that in my interactions with them. I think they're looking for someone who can get things done for Rhode Islanders in action orientation. I talk to people all across the state who are leading different parts of the state, whether they're in business or in nonprofits or in community organizations, where they're looking for a leader who has a tremendous work ethic, who listens deeply and can get things done. And that's what I've done my whole career. And that's what I would continue to do if I were governor. You mentioned um, some of the top things that, um, that people you've met within your neighborhoods and places that you've gone throughout the state. Um, first being priced out of Rhode Island. Uh, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I imagine, you know, we're talking about housing costs and, you know, and the rise of inflation at record levels. We were talking to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen back uh, in November for our annual mm -hmm. meeting and the whole notion of whether inflation was transitory um, mm -hmm. on a national, international level. Um, so what do you say to folks that, that you know, that worry about their own community, their own household, their own, you know, ability to be able to keep up with um, the rising cost of just about everything. Yeah, I, I think it is the number one thing I hear about from people. And I think it's very valid. Uh, look, we've, we've all come through COVID with a level of anxiety, stress, pressure, uh, that is very real. Uh, I'm particularly worried about, you know, our kids through all of this. But 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 housing is the number one issue I hear around affordability. And I, I talked to one teacher uh, who really put it well for me. He says, this is a man in his 60s. And he said to me, Helena, 40 years ago, I bought my first house in Rhode Island and I paid about two times my salary 
to afford this home. And here I am 40 years later, I've got three sons. They all would love to buy a home in Rhode Island, but it's going to cost them five times their salary. And I'm worried that my, my, my boys won't be able to afford to live here. And so I think that is, that's what I hear from so many different people across the state. Now, look, you don't solve a problem like that overnight. Rhode Island has been the worst state in the country in housing production per capita over the last decade. And, and so we have a real su supply uh, problem. But there are things we can do in the short term. And, you know, that's how I've always approached my business career is while you're aiming for the big, hairy, audacious goals, how do you make sure that you're creating momentum for people in the short run? We have a tremendous amount of money that's come from the federal government uh, around housing. For example, we got $200 million last year on making sure that people were not evicted from their homes because they couldn't pay rent. And we've only used half of that money. So when I talk to community leaders around that, they're saying to me, Helena, help us get the money to the people who need it. You know, don't let it get caught up in bureaucracy. And then related to the long term, I think there are things that we can do to make sure that the supply of housing stock goes up. I think we need to be looking at additional dwelling units in properties. You see that in Massachusetts and California, where you can add an additional dwelling unit and really increase capacity in the state. We need to be looking at the zoning laws. We need to be looking at um, the, the historical tax credits and say, look at all these old abandoned mills and schools. How do we turn those into great living spaces and create the right incentive so we get people investing in housing? So it's a very, very important topic. I think it's one where having a business mindset and experience can be very helpful and it won't be solved overnight. So we've got to help people where we can in the short term and build to something in the long term. Those are three very concrete ideas about how average families might be able to, um, you know, take on some of those, um, you know, those tactics mm -hmm. to change their own trajectory. So certainly, you know, adding a, an additional dwelling unit and sharing the cost with either extended family or, um, you know, children or, right. um, you know, other other relatives or rent that piece out. You know, that that could provide real financial relief. So. I think what you're saying is you're connecting ideas that can, in fact, be influenced by the office of the governor and bringing those down to the local level to tackle a really, you know, difficult problem like housing. Yeah, you know, I, one of the things, Lori, that's maybe struck me and surprised me in this race is um, a lot of politicians talk platitudes. You know, they you go on their websites and they've got this big, elegant language around these issues, but they've been... They've been working in government for their whole lives and they haven't actually produced results and they don't have solutions right now that are concrete, specific, actionable. And that's what I've done my whole career is I, I produce results for people. I get things done for people. And so on every topic I'm working on, I want to make sure that I have an action plan that people can understand that is clear and specific where we can get to work for Rhode Islanders and make, make things happen. And, that, that's why I'm excited to be running. The second issue you mentioned was um, the, the state of our K-12 system. Uh, yeah. Again, another very, very difficult, thorny issue. We've been, you know, I've been president of the Chamber of Commerce since 2005, so certainly been at the top of the agenda mm -hmm. since 2000, 2005. So mm -hmm. the question, you know, always becomes, you know, if we're going to talk here, um, you know, sort of these existential questions. Yeah. You know, why is it in your view that, you know, we, we can't get any traction on this? Yeah, it's really frustrating. And I agree with you. You know, we, we, we as business leaders, leaders know the importance of having a great workforce that's, that's really well educated. One of the things that I experienced in my career at CVS is I recruited hundreds of families to move to Rhode Island and 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 come work at CVS. And I would say 90% of them ended up living in Massachusetts for great public schools and driving to Woonsocket for work. So what I'm really focused on is what I can do about this. And I actually think this is an incredible moment in time. Specifically, I would use the majority of the ARPA dollars to make sure that we're focusing on 
our kids and our education system. I think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to really use this COVID learning loss as a pivot point. And so some specific ideas again around this one, Lori, is uh, to the extent that the federal government doesn't get its act together, I would make sure that we're using some of that money for universal pre-K. I would make sure that every kid in the school system across the state has access to before and after school. As a working mom, you know, I it, it's very hard to manage and a lot of people have a couple jobs. And, and so I would want to make sure that all of our schools could provide seven in the morning to seven at night care for the kids. I also think every school should be able to provide summer learning programs, which we know has been a, is a big place where uh, particularly in communities of color, people take a, kids take a big step backwards. And so I have very clear and specific ideas on these ARPA dollars to make sure that we keep investing in our kids and help them. I also believe that we should keep up the good work around construction of school buildings. You know, it's a, it, you have to feel a sense of pride when you walk into your schools. And certainly we, we've got a good beginning. We need to keep that going. And we need to keep using the bond money that the state has passed to make sure that we're getting our schools in, in a very good spot. So I, I, I'm the only person in this race who is really saying, let's use a big chunk of this ARPA money to make sure that we're investing in our kids, investing in education, and making sure that we put ourselves on the map because I think it's a moral duty we have to these kids. And I also think it's a tremendous economic issue. Yeah, I totally agree with you about the school buildings and, and then the bond yeah. that the Rhode Island voters have passed yeah. uh, to invest in our schools and then hopefully the additional tranche of money uh, to rebuild some of these aging, um, you know, these aging school buildings that yeah. You know, um, I know you've gone in many, many of these um, school buildings and met with children and, and seen exactly, you know, what they're dealing with in a, you know, warm, safe, dry environment or not, you know, depending yeah, exactly. if they're in school or not, right? Yeah. And what message does it send, you know, when we're not even willing to make sure that you don't have leaking buildings or buildings that are, you know, freezing cold for our kids? What message does it send about how much we care about them. So yeah, I think it's critically important that we invest in the physical buildings as well. We only have a couple of minutes left, uh, Helena. So I do want to um, uh, conclude with a uh, discussion about the business climate and mm -hmm. um, where you see Rhode Island having a competitive advantage in terms mm -hmm. of industry sectors and how can we really get that flywheel moving uh, yeah and faster um, on making some key bets. So uh, what, what do you what do you see in your crystal ball? Yeah, well, I think I think it's both it's both investing in the businesses that are here and making sure we've got a regulatory environment that's not overly complicated. We're sending a message to the businesses that are here that we want them to succeed. I also believe in the businesses that are in the here and now, there are a lot of uh, very small businesses, some of them um, women and, and black owned that don't get access to the same level of capital and resources. So I wanna make sure we're supporting them and connecting them in to the programs that they could take advantage of. And at the same time, I, I also see a real opportunity to make sure that we're investing in industries for the future. Uh, life sciences is a great example. I've spent a whole bunch of time up in Boston uh, with life sciences companies, Boston, Cambridge, Somerville. Here we are 50 miles away. Uh, we, 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 we need to be able to attract these businesses. And so I'm working with people in that sector to say, what specifically could we do to make sure that we bring those businesses down? I look at wind as an example of, well, we have this uh, running head start uh, we were the first in the country. How do we take advantage of wind manufacturing? And there's some really good things going on in Quonset that we need to keep supporting in our ports. Um, I look at the blue economy and all that URI has done to create an incredible school of oceanography, engineering, and making sure that we leverage these great institutions. And I will say that um, I think there are a lot of good things that have happened in the last decade, especially around the entrepreneurial climate the design-driven climate. You really have much more of an entrepreneurial 
uh, set than we did a decade ago. And I would want to keep investing in those businesses because this is an amazing state, right? And we should be a place that's really attractive for businesses to start up. And so thank you, Lori, and everyone on the chamber for all you've done around creating a better business climate. I'd love to stay connected with you on this and feel free to share any ideas and thoughts you have for everyone listening. You can email me at helena at helenafolks.com because what I know is that um, the people inside this state have the best ideas. One of the things I'll end by saying is everyone I meet with, I always ask them, if you were governor tomorrow, tell me what you'd do. And I have notebooks full of ideas on things that people would do that could get us moving today. And so I look forward to hearing those examples from people because I do believe I'm the kind of person who could listen deeply and make things happen. And I think that's what business leaders do. And I'd love to be able to do that for the people of Rhode Island. Alina, folks, thank you for joining us here on Chamber TV. There are so many issues we could go on and on and talk about all of the uh, the matters that you've addressed so comprehensively. And uh, I know that we'll have plenty of opportunity to have you back and continue to uh, discuss these things. Uh, but for now, it was great to be able to get to know you on a deeper level and to understand your leadership style and your motivation and sort of how you you know you would go about. Uh, attacking this this major responsibility of you know being our next governor and developing concrete actionable strategic ideas that resonate with people and change lives. So appreciate your time. Uh, I know you are running off to uh, continue your your day to day activities of you know meeting people and uh, doing what you do best. So uh, we will say goodbye for now and look forward to catching up with you very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. And thank you everyone for watching.